cool guy. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you guys. He knows lots of stuff about lots of stuff. Uh, this is Asta, and this is Phoebe. Hi guys, it's nice to meet you. I'm glad, I'm glad we were able to set this up today. So I, while well, we're, we're waiting for somebody, but like but from my understanding and uh, what, what Andrew and I have talked about, we, uh, we're just gonna kind of get to know one another and I'm, I'm willing to give you guys like sort of a question and answer uh, foundations of Qigong kind of thing. Just cause like, why not? Andrew and I talk about this stuff all the time. So it doesn't hurt to include anybody else in the conversation. That's what I figured. It seems like we all have a few, a few things that we have in common, some common interests. Sounds good. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, also, the person who just joined is Rose. Hi, Rose. Uh, she is also part of the group. Hi. <laughs> right on. Hi there. Hi. Thank you for doing this with us today. Hey, no worries. Um, so, I'm un under the impression that uh, I'm doing like a little how does Qigong work sort of thing. Because I understand you guys are all part of a different group doing uh, CD practice, like uh, remote viewing which is like, from my point of view, like a meditation practice, basically, right? Um, so if, if that's the case, if you have any questions about anything, feel free to let me, you know, let me field them as best I can. If I don't know what I'm talking about, I'll let you know. So do you have anything you'd like to talk about today in particular? Or are you just hoping I have a speech? <laughs> a little bit. A little bit? Yeah. That's totally honest. That's Maybe totally a honest. speech to start things off? <laughs> okay, fine. Um, so my name is Neil Ripsky. I started training the Chinese martial arts in 1986. And through just who I am, it became everything that I wanted to do about with my life. So I spent my whole life doing it. Uh, the last 10 years, I actually, I used to have a dojo of my own. And then 10 years ago, I shut it down and started traveling and doing workshops worldwide. I got I got into some of the Kung Fu magazines and Tai Chi magazines and things, so I was able to do workshops, right? So now uh, I've moved back to Edmonton, Alberta, where I grew up, and I'm starting a new, a new dojo here and all that kind of stuff, and I'm trying to do this online thing ever since COVID began. And the real truth is, the, like the reason I do this is because I've had so much success in my life from practicing this stuff that I feel like my teachers were super kind to me by, you know, being willing to share their culture and things with me to the point that I started to get it. And I know that other people can get those kinds of results because I've been teaching now for a long time. I've watched people grow and change. And I find that the biggest issue in Qigong, if we start there, is that there's a fundamental kind of misunderstanding about the word because people throw the word Qi around a lot. Are you guys familiar with the word chi in some context? Yes. Yes. Cool. So nine times out of ten, if you ask somebody to define that word, okay, they're going to go to a qigong class or whatever, they're going to end up saying it's energy, life energy. Uh, if you're into yoga, they're going to call it prana. They're going to they're going to use words like ki from reiki, that sort of thing, breath, but that really doesn't tell you anything. It's sort of this amorphous definition. Oh, you're going to work with your life energy. That sounds nice, but if you dig any clo deeper under the surface, you have to go like, what do you, how do you do that? How does that operate? So the thing is that the key is really actually in the word itself. I found that the deeper I went into Chinese medicine and, and Chinese philosophy, the more the things my teachers said to me actually made sense because I started to speak their language. So the word qi, for instance, right, is actually a drawing of a fire, like a campfire, with a pot, well, like a stove, and a pot over top of it on the stove, and the pot has a, uh, is boiling water, and the steam is lifting the lid of the pot. If I had a whiteboard here, I'd draw it for you. But. So this energy that is created, steam energy, that lifts the pot lid is the quote-unquote Qi, that's what they're talking about, is this intangible but forceful thing that exists, right? And of course, boiling water, when you think about when this language comes around, boiling water is life. It, you, don't, you don't live if you're not boiling your water, right? You're going to get dysentery and it's going to be bad. 
So all of life ended up connected, of course, to pots of boiling water in China because it was rice or millet that you were boiling. But this is where the life energy thing comes from. But the thing is, I, I feel like energy is like not taking it far enough. It's too amorphous. All kinds of energy are actually results of relationships. So two chemicals work together and they release energy. There's still a relationship taking place to create this energy, this so-called life energy, right? So how do you work on your chi? Well, the thing is the stuff my teachers would tell me, like, I have strong chi, that's why I don't get sick. They were really telling me what they were trying to say. I just didn't understand them. I have a lot of relationships in my body that have been taken care of. I eat well, I sleep well, I breathe deeply, I try not to stress, and thus the relationships in my body are strong, the chi is strong. So when you're doing qigong, the real fundamental of qigong is always to ask what relationship you're working on. Because everybody knows qigong by this sort of esoteric weirdness uh, that's like you're going to do breathing exercises. Well, yeah, but like why? Well, because, for instance, in the case of breathing exercises, if you are a normal person, you tend to breathe about 8 to 16 times a minute. In so doing, you use about 40 to 60% of your lungs. You generally don't breathe very deep. That would take longer. People who don't breathe very deep live shorter lives. This is just math. It, it's not so hard to figure out that if you don't oxygenate your blood, things will deteriorate over time faster, etc., etc., right? So why do you practice deep breathing exercises? Because you're changing the relationship of the oxygen and the blood in your body for the positive. And if you root your Qigong training in a place that's that physical and that like tangible to hold on to, then when you start to do the really weird Qigongs where you're dealing with your emotions or your mind or quote unquote using the energy, because it is, it is a thing, you start to understand that this is just a series of relationships and logical questions I need to ask myself. And when they start to become habituated things, like in the case of something like Tai Chi, right? Like what Andrew and I do, we do martial arts. Habituated relationships can create a lot of strength in the body, right? A, a, a weightlifter becomes extremely good at certain types of movement. They're super strong at them. Those sets of relationships of shoulders and whatever, that chi becomes very strong and it becomes useful in life. And that's kind of the idea. So like when you're really studying Qi Gong, you're doing the gong. Gong means, um, literally means the skill that is passed down, usually by your family, that is a result of a lot of work. It's not, it's, it's like you have to do a lot of work to gain this skill. So qigong is doing a lot of the hard work of studying the relationship, whatever that relationship is. And that's how you have all these different kinds of qigong, right? You've got Things like general health Qigong, which is what everybody kind of knows as Qigong, stuff that looks like Tai Chi, you know, soft movements and all that. And then you've got things like medical Qigong. Medical Qigong is taught in Chinese medicine as a, it's a prescription. So um, like one of the Qigongs that I know, for instance, was taught to me because I had a back injury, right? The turtle breathing exercise. I can show it to you guys if you want. And uh, that exercise is extremely good if you've ever hurt your lower back, which everyone in the world has done right? And it's just because it changes the relationships between the vertebrae and the disc. The chi becomes scattered when it's injured, strengthens when you do the exercise. So medical qigongs are really specific, whiplash or high blood pressure or that kind of stuff. Then you've also got what would be called spiritual qigongs. So like things like remote viewing would be considered a spiritual qigong practice from this point of view, because you're not dealing with the physical relationships of the body here. You're dealing with the mental relationships. You're dealing with what reality is about. It's about the mind and in the relationships that interpenetrate the mind and other people's minds. Then you've got things like martial arts qigong. And those are the ones that are meant to make people really strong or make people really powerful. And then last but not least, there's some uh, very specific focused health qigongs that are divide, uh, designed solely for longevity. So they're like maintenance qigongs that you're supposed to learn. Like if you're lucky, you learn them way before you need them. And then the illness that they are actually working against never appears. And those are, those are usually the ones you might see uh, like at the beginning of the Tai Chi class. If you see like an older class of people, 
if the master's an older guy, like not me, like an older guy, like 80 years old, those cats generally have those Qigongs as their warm ups because they're consistently preventing some kind of, you know, thing to, uh, from unraveling in themselves. Does that kind of make sense? How's that for speech? Oh, it's good. <laughs> so do you guys have any questions? Have you practiced Qigong I before? I have one. Yeah. I, I have one. Um, do you know any like blood cleansing um, Qigong for like the lymphatic system to help it drain? I have some lymph no- I, I have a missing lymph node, so I have a little hard time when I get mm. sick. Oh, uh, so I was wondering if there was anything I could do that might help with that. Yeah, sure. Um, lymph, lymph movement is all related to muscular contraction. So if we were to do it as a general lymph node one, I can show you one right now because actually the, the one I was just talking about does that. The Gui Xi Nei Jia, the English turtle breathing internal work. That's what that means. So if you want to stand up and do it with me, feel free. No big, I can't barely see you anyway. But the whole trick here, okay, is that I have to get out of my arms. So I stand up and I'm just going to kind of sway my arms a little bit just to get totally out of them, like ragdolled, okay? So if I turn my torso, my arms are just going to spin, right? They're just going to move. So now the trick in the movement here is that I'm actually going to stop my hips. So my head will stay looking at the camera, so it stays straight as my body turns. And I'm trying to keep my hips straight as my body turns. So I actually should be able to see that my knees aren't really doing anything. If I move my hips, this will happen. And my knees will turn. So I'm actually freezing the whole undercarriage of my body here. Okay. Okay. All right, and you've got soft knees, right? Yes, I've bent my knees, yeah. You never ever straight, like straighten a joint out. So yeah. I'm, I don't know, two, three inches down from like my full height here. So we want to get the feeling that we are not moving our arms, especially for the lymphatic system. We're trying to get flow. So it's like when you were a kid and you pick up a bucket of water and you whirl it around in the air because it's the coolest thing that it doesn't pour in your head, right? Okay. So that centrifugal force, we're trying to get that to build in our fingertips. Okay. So I'm so relaxed you, that I'm trying straight, to feel my you fingers kind of like your, fill up and almost like touch, sausage feeling. You know what I mean? What's that? Are you touching your body any any particular points up, yeah. up near your shoulder? Good okay. question. So now that we've got the body <laughs> twisting, what I'm doing with the arms here is that right underneath your collarbone, if you find your collarbone and you measure it, right in the center okay. below it, you'll find a spot like a little divot in the muscle and it's usually a bit tender, a little bit sparkly. That's the beginning of your lung meridian, okay? That's where the internal connection to the lungs of the body is. So what I'm actually doing is I'm taking my thumb and I'm bopping it into there, just a little gentle thud. So I'm not hitting myself hard, I'm just tapping my body. So on the back, if that makes sense, on the back, what I'm doing is I'm wrapping all the way around my spine. And I'm trying to hit my kidneys. Okay. All the way across. So the reasoning here, so if we keep going, the reasoning is that the organs in the body are in a big sack. And an awful lot of the blood flow that goes through our organ system actually has to do with muscular contraction as much as it has to do with the heart. So when we are moving normally, our hips and our hearts stay stuck together. We turn corners like this. We don't turn corners like this. We don't do this twisting thing very often in life. So when we're twisting our body like this, a few things happen. If I keep my hips and my head still, my spine is being twisted in two directions at the same time, one at the top and one at the bottom. So that pumps cerebral spinal fluid, nourishes the brain. The organs inside the body are being pushed against each other, which means it's kind of like they're sponges. So they get squeezed out and all of the stagnant blood leaves and goes back into the circulatory system. And then fresh blood can come in and that's what helps with organ usage, right? Because as we get older, we all eventually die from some organ not working anymore. So the idea here is, is that we're trying to wash them all with fresh oxygenated blood every day 
So that just doesn't happen, or it takes a really long time. However, a couple of the organs aren't in that sac. The lungs mm -hmm. are inside your ribs, so they're not being squished. So instead we massage them from the front. That's what this bump is. So my organ, the lung okay. meridian, which I said penetrates the body under the collarbone, it actually also exits into the hands on your thumb. So you're sort of taking the whole lung meridian and tapping it against itself, front to back. Okay. And then the back is the same idea. The kidneys aren't in that sac. They're fastened to the ribs. So you're just giving them a little bump so that they end up getting washed with blood as well. This is fascinating. <laughs> so this is really, this is a really neat Qigong. I, the very first time I ever competed in an international tournament, I stayed at this, uh, this B&B the night before. And so I'm, I'm nervous, right? So I'm practicing in the garden and the lady who owns the B&B comes home and catches me. She's like, oh, I didn't know you did Tai Chi. I was like, well, yeah, there's a big tournament. That's why I'm here. <laughs> so she makes dinner and everything. And afterwards is like, so my, my husband is the king of Thailand's doctor. Let me share something with you. And this was the Qigong the king of Thailand did. That's very cool. So the prescription is you're supposed to do four or five minutes of this. Right? Four or five minutes. Every day. And you'll, you'll start to see benefits probably within about a week. Cause I mean, just now you're probably getting the cracks in the back. Things are loosening up, right? Shoulders are probably feeling a little less stiff, all that kind of stuff. And that's a big sign of flow happening in the body, right? Back to the whole lymphatic system. Muscular contraction moves lymph. So just I'm writing, I'm writing the prescription down. <laughs> yeah, so four or five minutes a day. And this, this Qigong, I'll, if you want, I'll teach you the whole thing today. Why not? It has three different okay. exercises, okay? So you're supposed to do four or five minutes of this for 100 days. So like three months, a season, right? Okay. Then you warm up with this by doing it 100 times. And then there's a, a second movement. So the second movement is we hold like a bowl of water, like a bowl, a bowl of rice in our hands, okay? And... All I'm gonna do, I'm gonna side with you. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reach forward like I'm diving off a diving board and bring my hands down to the ground and then bring my weight back to my heels and then I press my feet into the ground and I roll my spine up so the tailbone moves first and then I go all the way, vertebrae by vertebrae up my back, standing up into the original position once my head gets up. So as we move down, normally you're not talking, but you're exhaling. So I'm running out of oxygen at the bottom. Body has pressed it all out. And then as I inhale, it's like the body blows itself up like a balloon. The torso is going to expand, right? So as the lungs increase in size, it actually opens up your back and stands you up. And the third exercise is that one reversed. So instead of diving off a diving board, I drink out of the bowl. And the liquid goes down through my body to my feet. Then I pick up some more water. Way over here, so I'm on my toes here, right? Come back to my heels and I drink the water and it comes down my body exhaling as I'm cr crouching, right? Because as my inhalation creates standing, I'm letting my exhalation create shrinking. Okay. So when you're doing this one, you're moving from the top of your spine to the bottom. Here, see how my eyes are following my hands? So my neck is moving yes. first, and then I'm gonna go down through Tanjong to the center of my back, all the way down to my waist until my tailbone itself kind of kicks out, right? So what you end up doing is you're undulating your back like a snake. So there's standing it up and there's putting it down. Make sense? So it's either from the top to the bottom or it's from the bottom to the top. So what so this ends up- So you're sort of reversing the motion. Yeah. So what this ends up doing is 
my first exercise does this to all the vertebrae. Uh -huh. And then my second one opens them this way, and then the third one opens them in reverse on the way down. So what you end up doing is creating more and more interstitial space in between your vertebrae, which is what relieves pressure on all of your discs, right? Uh -huh. Possibly makes you taller, theoretically. It hasn't done that to me, though. I'm positive I'm starting to shrink, actually. <laughs> I noticed it just the other day. Somebody looked a lot taller than they should. I'm not sure why yet. I'm blaming it on he's a lot younger than me, so he's still growing. That's what I'm hoping. Anyway. So do you guys have any questions? That's a very basic Qigong, and you can take that one to the bank. I've been doing that. When was that tournament? 1999. So I've been doing that for like 25 wow. years, that Qigong, and it's... Uh, Nothing fixes my back better than that one. That's why I do it all the time still. Because I had a back injury when I was young. Do you recommend doing this in the morning or in the evening or several times a day? Or... You can do it more than once a day. That's fine. Morning or evening depends on how you react to it. So okay. for me, this is a good morning Qigong because it wakes me up. And I feel energized after I do it. So it's no good at night. Because it's just going to keep me okay. from sleeping. So it's just depending on your body, how your constitution ends up taking it, right? Morning. Morning it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's my, that's my thing too, yeah. I mean, there's a few practices that I can do at night, but it's not any of the moving kind of stuff. It's usually meditative stuff that I can let myself kind of cool off afterwards and go to sleep. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any other questions about anything in particular? Is there anything you'd like to talk about? Andrew, any questions? Yeah, but, uh, um, yeah, I just had a quick question. Is this also good for a bone density issues? Oh, yeah. Right on. Okay. Yes, but there's better ones. Oh. I'll, I'll be honest. Like, this will help for sure. Um, I'll show you a bone density one if you're asking. It's really... This is a bus stop Qigong is what I call it. Because, like, if you're in Taiwan and you're waiting for the bus, you're going to see all the old guys do these ones. There's like 10 exercises everybody in the world seems to know. Um, to, so this one is like, um, all I'm going to do is the arm swing forward and back. Okay? Oh, and it, and it's, uh -huh. like, it's like I'm going to take, like I have water on my fingers and I'm flicking the water. Flicking the water off my fingers, see? So I'm flicking the water ah. at the camera. Maybe if I turn sideways. You can see there's a flick there. Now here's the trick. You start to go up and down with the flick. Now for bone density, there's something called shake the back and cure the 100 illnesses. And all you do is on that move, when your hands come up, you go up on your toes, and when you come back down, you just fall to your heels, thump. So it's up and thump. I'm trying not to smash on my part of the floor here, but. <laughs> Yeah, so that you're just lifting and dropping. Because what happens is if you keep your neck and your head erect, so don't look down, right? Ah. Then your head and your spine's in a nice line. So each one of those shakes is going through your whole skeleton. And your skeleton, when it comes to things like bone density, it, it, like it, all like the rest of us, right? We evolve uh, according to what it is that we're exposed to. So the bones are crystalline, diamond hard things. But if our life isn't something that they have to really deal with a lot of gravity or a lot of pressure, they don't have to be that strong. So the body will take resources from there and use it somewhere else, right? So usually what ends up being the case is as we get older, we get more sedentary because we're more sedentary, there's less stress in our bones. Our bones don't need to be as strong, so they get weaker. So just this, vibrating your own skeleton, wakes it up. It can't, and it can't, how do you explain that? It can't like fix one bone at a time. If you vibrate right. one bone even in your body, the, bone, the, the body will go, oh, I need to make like more bones. And it will make all of the bones harder, not one. Uh -huh. So in this case, we're using our heels and our shin bones to do that thing. We're making the bone vibrate on each one. So then that, it might not be vibrating your neck or whatever, who knows, but it is vibrating those. 
So then they are getting stimulated. There's going to be more, more bone marrow growth, et cetera, et cetera, right? If you give it the time. This is one of those things that's not, none of this is a magic pill, right? All of these things are like, if you do it for a hundred days, you will get the full benefit. That's the, that's the poetry, the Chinese poetry of all Qigong, is that once you've done an, an entire season, a hundred days, then you will understand what that Qigong actually does. Because you'll have, you'll have felt it happen now. But it won't happen really like in five days. You know, right. like for me, I've, I've done a lot of these and I've done the hundred day things. For me, it seems to be like two to three weeks in, you start to get sort of a, oh yeah, maybe something's different because it's such a subtle change. Right. And then by the end of, by the end of a hundred days, you're very sure about whatever that Qigong did. So like when the very first one I showed you today, um, when my back is bad, like I, I end up, if I'm traveling doing workshops and stuff on airplanes, I'll end up with a bad back. Right. That Qigong unravels it super fast now. But it took time before it started to do the job. Now my body's used to it, so I just maintain all the time, right? And it's the same thing if we had, uh, there's a few, if we had more time, there's other ones, but yeah, any kind of, any kind of that shaking force, like just bouncing on your heels should help your bone density. That's great, thank you. Yeah, yeah. that's no big deal. That's no problem. See, that would be like an example of a medical Qigong, because it's directly at a thing a single pointed thing, right? Whereas the, the first one realistically is more of a longevity Qigong because it's really an organ massage. So you're trying to make sure that the body gets and stays healthy eventually, right? Any other questions? This is good. No other questions? Ask a, ask a question. We're kind of going down the line. <laughs> yeah, someone's got to ask something. All my questions all my questions are about suggested readings. <laughs> oh, interesting. What do you, what, about what particular type of topic? Um, I have the, my main problem is feeling what's going on inside my body, like to feel the flow of energy or anything that's going on. Mm -hmm. So Andrew's given us a couple of really good ones, but I'm always in the market for more oh. about, I don't even know what you would call that or how to fix it interesting so what did andrew suggest um don't put me on the spot oh, I'm, I'm trying to put him on the spot what are you talking about oh, <laughs> op opening the energy gates is one. Oh, uh yeah. and also a uh, comprehensive guide to Taoist nagong yeah yeah because it's Down it's over. like a brick but it covers all of the stuff sure sure it does yeah um Wow. Okay. Well, I mean, there's a lot of things we could talk about. Number one, you got to read the Tao Te Ching. If I got to make a recommended reading list, that's number one. If you want to learn, if you want to learn Qigong, you have to understand Taoist thought. You have to have an idea of where the Taoists are coming from, because that's where Qigong originates. Um, like the, the 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 real origins of Qigong are so long ago that there's shamanic stuff about it. Right. It's like the indigenous practice of China is what Taoism is. It's like the indigenous religion, you know, and then eventually the, the Buddhists come in there and they smash together and you end up with Zen, right? Which is sort of like Taoism and Buddhism smashed together is what Zen Buddhism is like. Yeah. So you have like uh, Tantric Yoga Tara, Haruka, kind of Vajrayana Tantra coming out of Tibet and coming out of uh, India at the time, ramming into these crazy shamanic Taoist people. So the, the whole heart of Taoism, of course, is yin yang, which is the biggest thing that the Tao Te Ching is trying to teach. The problem is that the book is really hard to understand because it's a 81 poems about the same thing, essentially, which is very, very, very difficult at first to kind of penetrate. But if you understand an idea of what yin yang is, then Qigong practice has a real foundation. So like, for, for example, um, Everybody knows the, the diagram, right? With the two, the white and the black, and they're circling each other. Everybody calls it a yin yang. Um, and a yin yang is actually the, the names of the two colors. So what, where people go wrong generally is just that uh, we have a tendency to make vi uh, very literal and absolute definitions of things. So traditionally, to learn yin yang theory, you start with 
things that are yin and things that are yang. So they make sense to you. So like heaven and earth. People, you know, men and women are yin and yang to each other. That type of thing. But nothing is actually pure yang and nothing is actually pure yin. It's a relationship between the two things. It's like a coin. There's a heads and a tails. And one is actually defining the other one. So as soon as I say that one thing exists, like in the Tao Te Ching, it says, uh, the second you recognize beauty, you've created ugliness. It's a great quote. Because the moment you decide and you make this judgment that something's beautiful, you also decided something isn't. That's the other side of that coin. However, as people, we tend to see the first thing in front of us and accept that as the reality and the truth. So the first side of the coin is sort of where everybody lives. So the idea of learning the yin yang theory is that you are constantly then realizing, oh, the first most obvious thing that occurred to me was, you're moving your hands in Qigong. So that's probably not what's really going on. That can't be the whole story because what's the other side of the coin? Well, it must be like breathing or thinking or whatever it might be in the exercise. So when your understanding gets to the point that you can take anything you're already learning, and just look at the other side of it and go, well, how does the other side work? So what is yin-yang? What is the yin-yang pair? Because one always exists. So in any movement, for instance, if there's a movement that moves forward, there's another part of your body that moves backward. Let's take that as a prime example, Tai Chi example. Why do we care? Well, if I push forward with one hand, I only use the muscles here to do so. If my whole body's a part of this, and one hand is the yin, and it's moving backwards, then my torso starts to turn, and a whole bunch of my body works to do this movement, which means I could push this really heavy door open really easily suddenly, whereas this might have been difficult. And the thing is, that's the body. We think of our bodies as these, all these separate parts, and it's not like that. We move our arms, and we move our legs, and then we sit on our butts and we don't think of ourselves as a whole working being all the time. I mean, the curse of Western education in a way is uh, it roots us in the duality that mind and body are separate things, but they're not. They're really not. The whole idea of Qigong is that relationship. Literally, the, the, the concept of having Qi means that your mind and body, which you thought of as separate things, are starting to not be that way. You're starting to let go of those false ideas you were you either were taught or modeled or you sort of picked up on your own or whatever it is that, that happens to us as we grow up, right? In our Western education, it's the way it is. It's kind of like unraveling some kind of indoctrination in a way. And it's really nothing more than what's the other side of this coin. So when you're practicing any Qigong, that's why I first recommend people say, what's the relationship we're working on? Because otherwise there's only one side of the coin. You're just doing the stupid Tai Chi class at the YMCA and, you know, doing your thing and whatever the old people are doing. Great. That's fine. It's good for them. Is there another side to the coin? Of course there is. But if nobody asks about it, nobody introspects about it, nothing ever changes. So the Tao Te Ching is a great bit of advice, except it's really hard to read. And it's, it's about yin yang. Um, the best kind of advice I can give you for Qigong in particular is to get your foundations really well laid. Learn one Qigong from somebody you think kind of knows what they're talking about. And then you use the, the philosophical underpinnings of those books to tear the Qigong apart because everything is very logical, actually. It just looks esoteric to Western educated people. It did to me. I mean, one of the reasons I got attracted, I was attracted to internal stuff and Qigong stuff because I got injured in a construction site when I was 19 years old doing Kung Fu. So, I mean, I hurt oh, wow. my back. Might go to my Kung Fu master and I'm like, I can't train, I'm injured. He's like, nope, come here. And starts teaching me Qigong and Tai Chi to fix my back. So I was really lucky because I was like 20 years old and magic happened, right? I did the exercises my teacher told me to do and I'm okay. So my belief system was utterly changed because I had no idea why it was working. I just knew that I followed his prescription and it did. That's what drove me to Chinese medicine and such because I've always been the guy that wanted to know why. And I, I think now it makes me a better teacher because I have a good explanation most of the time because I've thought about most of them. I mean, if I don't know how one works, I'll tell you. Just that's the way it is. But such is life, right? 
But if you have the foundations, the foundations carry you through everything else that's weird and esoteric and much more advanced, perhaps. Do you have an edition of the Tao that you enjoy or could recommend that you like? What's that? Sorry again? Do, do you have a good recommendation for an edition of the Tao Te Ching that you really like? Um, short answer, yes. Thomas Cleary. Okay. He's awesome. He's a good translator. He is. Long answer. Awesome. Read three or four of them. Okay. Because everybody is translating from Chinese. So you have to get the translator's mind out of your way, right? You have to look at how they're, how they're putting across the concept and not the words they're using. So I, I find when I'm reading those kinds of things, like I, I read about, I'm, I'm Buddhist, so I'm all into Buddhist sutras and all that stuff, but I want to read it out of more than one English speaker in a perfect world. Because everybody sees yeah. those words differently, right? And when it becomes subtle, it's hard. And <laughs> Dao Te Ching is subtle and hard. <laughs> Yeah, super subtle and hard. Yeah. So that, like two or three though usually works because in three people saying sort of the same thing points at a truth, right? That's that's very good. That's a very good point. Yeah. It, it seems that way to me. Like I mean, in, in real life with people now, especially any of this martial arts stuff, especially the esoteric stuff, I have to hear it from about three different sources that don't know about each other. And if I hear that, then it's like okay, no matter how crazy this idea is all of these sources are agreeing with it. So maybe I'm the problem here. I don't understand something, right? That's, that's, that's why translations are difficult. It really is. I was very lucky because my main Qigong teacher, Sifu Chen, um, he and I had a language barrier. He spoke, he speaks Can or spoke Cantonese and Mandarin. And my Mandarin is terrible, my Cantonese is worse. So we were constantly using translators and his daughter was helping us and all this other stuff, but it meant that he had to explain things to me over and over and over. So as his vocabulary changed, so did the explanations, right? He'd be teaching me the same lesson, but now he spoke more English or I spoke more Chinese. And it was interesting because I, I've heard the same lesson 50 times in 50 different ways and he was saying the same thing and it really seems that way with translations of books because you're still dealing with that translator's mind in the way because if you don't speak the language then you have a there's always a possibility that you might not get the right idea yeah, yeah. totally agree yeah um but there's lots of great books yang Jing ming writes good books on qigong Oh, his Qigong book is uh, one of the ones I recommended too, the big green one. Yeah, that figures, yeah. Yeah, he, he wrote basically like an encyclopedia. It's not very beginner though, truthfully. I mean, he was, he's translating uh, some old manuals is what he's doing, eh? So they're not super clear, but they're good. I don't know. I'm trying to think, I, I've, I've written a couple books that are... I don't want to be that guy who's recommending my own books, though. It seems kind of lame. <laughs> That's okay. Oh, go ahead. It's it's lame. Lame. Yeah, be that guy. Be yeah. that guy. <laughs> I mean, the Andrew can send you the thing, whatever. I, I, wrote okay. one, I wrote one called The Dantian Connection. And what it is is about, about how to cultivate a Dantian, which really, um, if you're familiar with Chinese Qigong, Dantian is like the battery of the body. It's where the qi is stored, right? Yeah. Um, it would be like your root chakra if you were using the chakra system. And the idea of cultivating a Dantian is that like everybody has one, but it's like a barren field. It's there, you're just not doing anything with it. So you have, there's some exercises you have to do before this, this idea of this being a thing, um, this Dantian starts to become more real to you and you feel the effects, like this twisting thing, for instance. Um, muscularly, what it ends up doing is it ends up actually working on the very, uh, left and right sides as they twist against each other. There's six different sides to your downtown. And it has to do with pairings of muscle groups and how your mind integrates with them. So it, as they get stronger and they get more balanced, things like your digestion gets better, right? You don't have any regularity problems, stuff like that, just because all of the muscles down here in your guts are really well co coordinated. And it, it's interesting, I mean, if you're wanna hear another speech, Dantian is really an interesting subject, I think, because we're, um, we're here for we're here for this. Okay, cool. We're here yeah, for fine. Yeah, I, just, I won't shut up. <laughs> I just won't shut up. It's fine. 
So Dantian, good words. Uh, Dan, D-A-N, means uh, a furnace. It means like a furnace on a Taoist mountain where you would cook medicine, where you would make the pill of immortality is actually literally how it reads. So it's like a, a cauldron or a, a brazier, something that you could heat something in. And then Tian is actually field, literally like rice field. Okay, so it's a place where energy comes in the body, right? Rice represents life. That's where the life energy stuff again comes from, right? Is anything having to do with rice and rice fields? You're talking life stuff. So interestingly enough, if you go back far enough in time, this is what I was talking about earlier, if there's kind of a shamanic vibe, if you go really far back in Taoism, so if you go far enough back, imagine you have no education in science at all, like tribal times. All you'll start to realize is that sometimes you get hungry and you feel bad here. And then when you eat a sandwich, you feel good here and you have energy. Energy comes from here. How did the energy get there? Well, I ate the sandwich, it must have energy in it. And they're not wrong. I mean, they're talking about calories, right? It's, it's very logical. But if you go way back and you, you have that kind of thinking, no education, it starts to be that life energy that from the things that you eat, the things that you drink, and the air that you breathe, go here. It's stored here. That's Dantian. And they're right, because if you look at our body now, that with what we know now, we know that's how it works. When you, when you digest food, you get energy. You feel good here, and then you feel good everywhere. And the idea is that there's different types of chi that can be cultivated for the Dantian. So when it comes to health, you're always looking at the food you eat, the air you breathe, and the water you drink. That's the number one thing, because it's over and over and over. Whatever you put in your body is what your body will become, right? Every seven years, your cells replace themselves. So given enough Big Macs over enough years, you're made of Big Macs. Not <laughs> cool, right? So those are your first relationships with your chi and your health is your nutrition, right? What you actually allow to take in to become a part of you. Then you get into the more esoteric stuff when you're trying to build chi by doing exercises. Some of those are relationships in the body so that muscle, muscle groups work together, lymph gets pumped, all that kind of stuff. Some of them are very much uh, mental exercises where you're only working on something like the breath. And it goes so far until like, those mental exercises are pure stillness. You're not moving at all, right? It, for example, if we were to take a second here, and uh, I'll just show you a really basic, a basic meditation. Because a, a meditation is qigong. It's energy. It's, it's work on a relationship. The relationship, of course, here is the ultimate in esoteria, though. It's the mind. It's totally intangible. It's ethereal, right? We all possess it, but it's hard to exercise. So here's the idea. My, my, this is from my, my meditation teacher, Long Poor. If uh, meditation, very, very simply, is bringing the mind to a single place and leaving it there. So it's like a muscle. If you never lift anything with your arms, your arms eventually will atrophy until you can't lift anything, right? So the same thing, the mind's power or mind's strength is built up through exercise. It's just like not weightlifting, it's weightlifting with your mind. And that's kind of what focused meditation is. There's different types of meditation, but at the very foundation, you start with a single pointed focused meditation, concentration. So simply all there is to it is you pick a point in your body that you're gonna use as a focal point. I use Dantian because martial arts guy, right? Qigong guy. So I just made sense out of that. Um, a lot of Buddhists actually use their heart. Uh, other people will actually use the, the upper dantian in the head, in the center of the brain, or on the third eye, yin tang, if you will. Whatever one, doesn't matter. The point is that you bring your mind to that single place, and then you're going to take a two-syllable word, and you're going to make a, a silent recitation out of it. So you're making a mantra, a silent mantra. So the only things that you need to have for kind of required for this to be safe and for it to work is that it should be a word that has a good meaning to you. 
because you're essentially pavlopping yourself here. So if you pick money and you're like, okay, I'm going to do my meditation and he'll taught me money, 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 <laughs> like good luck. That's not going to turn out great. Okay, it's not, not going to turn out super good in the end. Um, so like my word, right? My meditation teacher's word was Bhutto, which is Pali for Buddha. It means to purify yourself. And because he was the guy who told it to me, it only means that. So that's my word. It's not even an English word. I can't get, I can't get Pavlov the wrong way because there's no other connotation. So you pick some word, right? And then what you do is you silently in your mind, repeat that word to your focal point as though you're speaking to it. And that's it. But what's going to happen is that your mind is going to be like, did I turn off the toaster? And you're going to wonder about the toaster and you're going to walk through your kitchen in your mind and you're going to make sure it was turned off and then you were good. Right. Okay. Toaster's fine. House isn't burning down. I was meditating. Going to go back to that. And then the next thing you know, it's about the car. The act of meditation is returning to meditation. Everybody's monkey mind pulls them away from what they're doing. <coughs> it's just how it works. So it's like, the longer you can stay in one place, the longer you hold on, the more your mind's strength grows. And the monkey mind will drag you away sometimes. And the whole idea is you just let that go, don't go down the garden path with it, and go back to what you were doing. And over time, the monkey mind gets tired of you because you're not fun to play with. So it just starts bothering you less. It goes and finds something else to do. It goes and murmurs in the background, right? But it's no longer taking you away from your meditation. My teacher, Long Por, described it like a bank account. It's like every time you do a meditation this way, you're depositing in your bank account this mind power. And then this mind power is what you use to deal with life. So if you think about it, there's a type of meditation, actually. It's called natural meditation that we actually all do every day. And we do it right before we go to sleep. Right when you're falling asleep and you stop thinking, and you haven't started dreaming, there's a moment where everything goes really quiet. And we sit there for a little bit, not long, but it's a moment where we're actually in a state of meditation before we go to sleep and drift off. And each day that builds mind power for us. However, it builds, you know, one unit of mind power and my stress at work tomorrow is one and a half units of mind power. So what happens is you end up running a deficit over your life. This is a way to explain things like memory loss in older people and Alzheimer's disease and things like that. It's just that the mind is starting to grow weak. They've had a stressful life. They've burned up all their mind power because, you know, life's hard. And if you're not exercising the muscle you're using all the time, eventually you tear it, you break it. So if you continually practice this mantra, this silent recitation of a word to a focal point, your mind will be able to hold on to that mantra longer and longer and it gains more and more strength. That helps prevent those kinds of things. And it's also what ends up being the thing that creates quote unquote chi. It ends up being the, the concentrated moment where everything is all gathered in one place where you can actually do something with it. Because everybody's got lots of chi. It's just that it's scattered all over your body doing all these different jobs. Whenever we're doing a Qigong or a meditation, we're gathering all of those relationships and bringing them to one place. And that's not easy. Like that's like holding on to something. So it builds power to do that. It builds strength to do that. So, I mean, there's no reason for us to do the meditation right now, unless you really want to, but that is the basic meditation method. And quite literally, I, when I was training with him, uh, because I'm who I am, I ended up becoming friends with uh, the monks at the temple. And truthfully, it's exactly what the monks learn. Like it really is. They just had to learn a whole bunch of prayers. But when they were meditating, this is the thing that they start with for the first like few years. And it really does cause really incredible benefits. Same sort of thing within 100 days. If you did that for five minutes a day, you'll notice it in 30 days, truthfully. You, it doesn't take 100 for that one. In 30 days, you'd notice that things are a little different. You just, it, it kind of puts a, a filter on your emotions. Like things don't set you off as easy. Everything, you know, it kind of turns the volume down on the world a little bit, makes you a little bit more chill. Like I'm, I'm a totally way more chill guy than I used to be. Absolutely. And it's a result of that. It's a result of that because the, 
the stress has nowhere to land anymore most of the time. Does that kind of make some sense? Does anybody have any questions? No, I think it's awesome. I've, I, I've, I'm going to incorporate all this stuff and try it for a hundred days and see how it works, how it goes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, I mean, there's no reason you can't. This stuff is super simple. Like you only need a few lessons usually and you have it perfect. Because most of it's really quite easy stuff. It's just the fact that people don't put the time in to do the practice themselves, right? I mean, that's why Andrew's so unique, right? As he's been training fr from a distance with me for a number of years. That's real hard. It takes a lot of tenacity and willpower to like just make yourself keep doing the thing. Because, you know, gardens, you can't force them to grow. You just have to keep watering them and wait. And that's what all of this stuff is like. You know, that's how I see, that's how I see teaching. Like, I don't even like the word teaching almost anymore because all I can do is share what I've learned. And either you're going to be into it and vibe with me and practice it or you're not. And that's cool. Either way, because nobody's everybody's teacher. You know, personalities, blah, 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 whatever. But um, as long as, as long as the good information's out there, maybe some kind of benefit will happen. That's the way I see things. You guys have any questions, any comments, concerns, criticisms, issues? Sarcasm? <laughs> Nothing? Uh, how do you feel about, um, how do you feel about the guy that's been teaching us for, what, how long have we been with Oz? Like a year now, everybody? Oh, I thought you were going to make him talk shit about Andrew right to his face. Oh, no, 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 I know, right? No. Um, I don't. How do you feel in general about what we're doing with all of that? Like Oz aside, even just the whole. Well, thing I mean, that we're from doing. what I've talked to, because I'm not a part of the group, right? And I don't know the guy. Um, just talking to Andrew and stuff. From what, from my perspective, I take I, this is from a really different perspective, probably. I'm trying to think of how to couch this so that you understand what I'm talking about. From a Buddhist perspective. Remote viewing would be a CD. And a CD is like, it's super weird. They, they translate it as super normal powers, right? And because it's not normal. Remote viewing is one of the CDs that Buddha was supposed to have had, right? He was supposed to be able to do things like read people's thoughts, travel to distant places, be seen in two places at once. All of those kinds of legends actually come way, way out of the past. Um, when, when I trained with my teacher, so I, had, I was very lucky, uh, I got to train with the abbot of a Theravadan Buddhist monastery. I got to become his disciple here in Canada because he, like he didn't like the heat in Thailand, so he moved here where it's cold. What a weirdo. So I got to, I got to very luckily train with, with Wong Por. And the way he described CDs was that if you, like I was talking earlier about the power of the mind, if the mind's power increases a lot, there's this place he called the authoritative mind power point. It's sort of like a, like a specific gravity. It's like when all the gravity finally hits from all your practice, experiences start taking place, okay? And they start taking hold. And the CDs, these super normal kind of abilities, sometimes will naturally appear out of them. And that's, um, this gets kind of specific into the religion part of it, but in his lineage of his religion, that was their kind of official party line, is that they're a natural occurrence. So you shouldn't worry about them. And the Buddhist sort of party line of this is the CDs are super normal abilities that are acquired by having really powerful minds, but they're distractions. Yes. Because if you're remote viewing, you're not meditating. You're not working on yourself towards enlightenment and becoming, I'm going to get all Buddhist here. You're, the real goal is to become a Buddha yourself so you can help everybody else, right? Yes. So if I'm busy doing remote viewing, I'm not on my way doing that. So I'm getting distracted. So interestingly, Lung Por, right, was uh, he used to actually have a healing class at the temple. And so he would literally teach that in one class then walk into the other one and go teach healing practices energy healing practices so I cornered him on it because that's why I am I'm like dude what is up 
And he's like, not everybody's going to try to be a Buddha. So if they can get to this point, at least they're being a benefit to other people. But it is still a distraction depending on what you're trying to do. So there's, there is also training in his religion um, towards Siddhis directly, where you actually practice specific kinds of meditation, like, like what we just did, but directed directly at something like that, where the result is, you know, 10,000 hours of this, this thing should happen sort of thing, right? You should end up with this Siddhi. But it's a very controversial thing in that sect of Buddhism because it's still considered a distraction. Because Would this be part of the Vasudhi Maga? That's exactly what it is. That's what that book is. Mm. Is 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 Buddha Gosa wrote a book all about how all the CDs work. That must have been probably what his manifestation was, is my guess. Is that somehow through his training he got a ton of them and figured out how they happen, so he wrote it down for disciples, right? Because the thing is if you start getting CDs to work, your mind is powerful. You're getting you're getting signpost experiences. You're going past the sign that's like, you know something now. Like, if you guys can remote view, I can't remote view, but that's a CD sign. That means you already have a level of ability with your mind that the other Buddhist practices would work for real, because, like, you have the mind for it. So, like, what we did earlier, right? That's kind of a, almost a remedial class, in a way, in comparison to a CD, right? But then you would apply this this ultra focused mind to something uh, in 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 a direct way. So like most people don't know much about Buddhism. I don't I don't know where you guys are at. Maybe you know lots, and I'm enough. You know, I'm boring you. But um, everybody knows about the things like the four noble truths, right? That's the very basics of Buddhism. Well, the idea is that when you're in meditation and you have a very focused mind, you can start to work on logical problems. And Buddhism is sort of this set of logical questions that you're meant to ask yourself. And you just come up with your own answers. That's it. But what ends up happening is the answers seem to be the same ones that Buddha found as well. And it keeps, for me at least, it just keeps happening. Because the more logically I approach everything, the more things kind of tear themselves apart. So like in the, in the Four Noble Truths, right, the very first truth is that to be alive is to experience suffering. There's four sufferings none of us get away from. That's just life. We're all going to have old age, sickness, birth, and death. We have to go through all of those things. So to be alive as a human being means we're going to suffer at least those four times, even if we're Elon Musk, who suffers much more than that. But if that's the case, then the second noble truth, right, is that suffering is due to attachment. Well, what does that mean in my life is where the meditation begins. Do I suffer because of my own attachments? So when I'm doing a meditation, I'll sit and I'll buto, 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 get myself in a good stable place. And I'll ask a question like that. I'll be like, okay, what, what did I suffer from today? Was I angry today? Angry? Was I grieving? What, what was up? Depressed? And when one of those things jumps out, I can go, okay, come, what, was, what was the point of that? Where did that come from? And it's always drills down to I'm attached to something because there's kind of only two things that happen in life right you either end up with a whole bunch of stuff you didn't want or you end up wanting a whole bunch of stuff you didn't get and that causes suffering for us all right so if I can just kind of let go of that life starts to get way easier so as you as you transverse through Buddhism you just start asking more and more difficult questions so, I'll give, I'll give, as an example, I'm sure everybody's heard um, of, of Zen koans. What is the sound of one hand clapping? Most famous one. Right. right. The yep. unanswerable question. There are answers to those questions. It's just that you can't think like a normal person thinks to catch them. <laughs> so, for instance, this is one of the meditations, one of the very first meditations that I generally teach when people kind of get, you know, past the basics. Um, and if you want to try it, I, I recommend you give it a shot because it's, it's really interesting. Get into meditation, you're stable, you're feeling good, everything's stable, the, the monkey mind's not bothering you. And then the only question you need to ask yourself is where do you live? In your body. So if I ask people, hey, where do you reside in your own body? And I asked you to point at it, 
Where are you going to point? Yeah, right? So most people point at their heads because I think in here. Some people point at their hearts because I feel right here. And they're both right, I think, kind of. So the question becomes, how do you, I, where do I actually live in my body? And if you go into meditation and you ask yourself that question, generally there's a, uh, an answer comes. I'm not going to spoil the surprise. You guys play with it. But you get, you get an idea of what, uh, what the idea of emptiness is. You get an idea that it's not quite what we think it is. Because how can something so fundamentally simple, where do you live in your body, be an unanswerable question for 8 billion of us? It's crazy. But it's because we don't ever consider it. Because we're busy with the world out there. Buddhism is all about what's going on in here. This is already happening. How I react to it, however. My actions and thoughts and feelings, that's under my control. So if I end up stabilizing my mind through meditation, and I get a strong mind, and I start asking myself like hard questions, like what am I really attached to? Why was I a dick to the TV repairman? Like what was that about? then I end up changing my own personality for the better. And that's the idea, is that you eventually transform towards being a Buddha, right? Which is a, a fully realized human being who is doing